Good morning, guys. <laughs> I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the, the founder and executive chairman of Aglaya Capital. Aglaya Capital is a, an independent corporate finance boutique specialized in alternative financing and alternative investments and a fintech blockchain venture capital for early stage projects. I developed my professional career uh, within the investment banking, corporate finance, restructuring, and uh, M&A, very focused on financial institutions and real estate um, um, as well, uh, chairing international executive positions in several entities, among others in BBVA. When I was the head of corporate expansion for consumer finance, insurance companies, banks for several geographies, and also the, the head of the Iberian uh, investment, bank, uh, investment bank in distressed asset, uh, asset unit. Um, I also developed my professional career in the in two of the big four in KPMG corporate finance. When I had all, I headed also the the Spanish financial institution group within the, the European group, and in Pricewaterhouse when I was in auditing mainly for financial institutions, corporate treasury, and also corporate finance. I start. Uh, I I also start my professional career as a broker in bonds, and also I work. I was working in a couple of, of banks more. I'm an entrepreneur and had several projects. I was involved in several projects uh, in in for of tech and, and blockchain in the last eight years. And I founded Aglaya Capital with the mission of combining like the uh, traditional corporate finance world and financial uh, industry with the new digital world. Good. I'll take up. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Shachindranath. Uh, I'm a financial services professional turned entrepreneur. Uh, after spending almost 25 years of uh, professional career in uh, multiple uh, financial services businesses, uh, I set up in a lending institution uh, in 2017. Uh, by acquiring a listed uh, non-bank finance platform. Uh, the objective and mission of doing that was to solve the problem of uh, credit for small and micro businesses in India. Uh, this problem is uh, is a roughly around $600 billion problem, wherein the access to credit for a small and micro business is, is a serious problem. And uh, mm -hmm. my uh, our, our vision and mission is that we build a technology-enabled digital a highly specialized platform uh, which serve this problem uh, which served and tries to find this problem uh, and its its solutions we started this business by raising almost 130 million dollar capital uh, 135 actually currency has changed uh, which was the largest ever capital raised for an early stage uh, financial services platform this capital mm -hmm. was contributed by you know few of the large diversified private equity players we raised money from the capital market uh, we started, uh, hmm, we waited, we did around a one year of technology development and play. We started our credit disbursement from January of 2019, uh, and we have now fully deployed our capital. Uh, and things like pandemic and some of the other things we see a, in a greater opportunity for us to now accelerate and go deeper into the SME and micro SME financing business in India. Hmm. Impressive. Hi, I am uh, Vijay Mehta. Uh, I'm the founder chairman of Mefcom Capital Markets. We are a listed company on BSE. I founded this company somewhere in 1985. And uh, we went straight into managing IPOs. Within a period of about 10 years, we became the largest private merchant banker in North India. And then over the time period, we have gone into portfolio management. We have gone into uh, stock broking. We are members of BSC and NSC. We have been mainly specializing into SME and MSME sectors. Uh, and we are primarily a fee-based company. Uh, besides that, I am uh, involved into a number of trade bodies, which are and we are on different panels of the government for which whenever there are any policy issues which are there, then we are representing on behalf of the industry. And uh, slowly and steadily, I think, uh, so far as I am concerned, uh, we are 
almost steady, not uh, uh, planning to expand anymore. And we like to stick to our core areas. We see a lot of future in them, especially in the portfolio management. And uh, that is how we plan to keep our market share. Okay. Um, I think that we shall continue with the, with the question that we have. Um, um, one, the first one is, what are the key weaknesses of the Indian banking sector that have been particularly highlighted by the crisis? And what policy and regulatory... Ah, hello. We have another one joining us. Hi. Sorry, there was a major... Do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll talk about it and introduce myself after this. No, Suman, actually, we, we were just about on the first question. So why don't we complete uh, your and Am Amir's uh, introduction? That would be good. Okay, hi. Uh, Suman, so I've uh, been a, a, a traditionally a non-investor, non-banker, and I've been a, on the operating side, ran businesses across the world for some of the largest uh, companies across uh, Europe and the US, uh, but, but essentially worked across the world. And then 2018 decided to uh, step out and turn into uh, initially a, we thought we'll just do a investment uh, uh, you know fund but then realized that uh, it was pretty much like you know taking a hammer and looking for a wall on a and a, and a nail so we, we kind of reworked ourselves and and we focused and doubled down on uh, on the on the sustainable development goals uh, we look bring in uh, not just our own capital but purpose capital into the into the play and what we really bring in is uh, our operating expertise and our uh, understanding across the world for for these uh, for these businesses. And uh, so we work in healthcare, education, environment, agriculture, and livelihood. These are our prime areas of uh, areas of support. Yeah. So that's who I am. Happy to be here. Okay. Great. Amir, um, yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. I had, I had some technical issues. I logged back on and off a couple of times, but now I am here. Uh, so I just uh, introduce myself or do I yeah. have to? Yeah, okay. please, sure. please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great being here. I know it's early in Spain and everyone's all around the world. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in Delhi today. So, uh, But anyway, my background is my, uh, my name is Amir Prabhu. I run Nafa Capital. We have a uh, it's an asset management and financial services business. We have a, a private equity fund which invests in agriculture and sustainability, a public equities and debt markets fund. Uh, we have a wealth management business <clears throat> and we're just in the process of launching a supply chain NBFC to finance the supply chain uh, from and our operating business. Uh, from our holding company, we also do strategic advisory in uh, clean energy and uh, proprietary investments from our balance sheet uh, where we've invested in a rural finance NBFC. We've invested in a back and spine clinics we've invested in ayurveda uh, we also uh, have invested in uh, and we also partner with foreign businesses coming into india so we do deal a bit with the banking system uh, in india and we see the share of challenges but primarily we also see it from the uh, investment or the company side because in terms and and you know so i'm glad that this topic is being discussed today because i think post covid it's a very opportune time to discuss uh, uh, the scenario of the Indian banking sector. And, you know, as we go through our uh, uh, event today, I'll share a few of my ideas. Thank you. I, I yeah. think so that we have lost Angela again. Okay. So uh, let me uh, let me take the first question. I think so, just so that we carry on. I think there's some difficulty in in this platform itself. Uh, we unfortunately, our moderator Arun has not been able to join yet, but I'll I'll take a few of his questions. So for first was that you know given that we're looking at the banking per se, uh, and uh, Amir can let me start. Given that you as you said that you deal with some of the banking and you're intending to start an NBFC as well. But what you are seeing as the key weakness of Indian banking sector and particularly which is highlighted by this crisis. And do you think that there is more policy and regulatory changes are required uh, to create a more resilient banking system? Sure. Thank you for uh, your question. Just in terms of, uh, so we have an investment in an NBFC. We own 10% of a rural finance NBFC and uh, it's called uh, Ifko Kisan uh, Rural Finance. 
and wow. ICI, ICICI and uh, also NH Capital from Korea, along with IFCO, are the other shareholders. And we are also in the process of launching a 100% owned uh, NBFC for doing supply chain finance. Yeah. So I think the banking sector in India, you know, I think, unfortunately, the current situation, I mean, we all know how banking was done back in the day. But the current situation is that a lot of good people are credit averse. You know, a lot of the bankers today are scared of giving out credit primarily because they're also worried about what could happen to them tomorrow, especially in the PSU banking space. The flip side of that is also a lot of good credit isn't coming. So, for example, the reason why we want to be in the like it's the two sectors we've chosen, rural finance is an area where credit doesn't go, you know, through our, that's why, I mean, of course, banks all have to meet priority sector, priority sector lending, but credit doesn't reach the last mile. And hence, you know, an NBFC like ours exists. Similarly, on the supply chain, let's say if you have a big company like Hero or TVS, the tier one supplier gets finance, but the tier two, tier three, tier four supplier does not get finance because of, you know, and the, and the person is not enough equity in the business. They don't have the ability to. So unfortunately, the the banking sector in India, there are, I mean, and that's where, of course, creates the opportunities for NBFCs. But there are lots of these loopholes, you know, ac- across the uh, spectrum, be it in uh, project finance, be it in uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, priority sector lending, etc. So I think s- systematically, if we want to sort out banking in India, I would say it needs four pillars. One is we really need to greatly expand the use of technology, you know, in banking. And, uh, and while people think blockchain is a bad word in India, I think blockchain is something which is extremely important to bring into banking so as to verify transactions. And if we do that, stuff like Nirav Modi issues will not happen, you know, in, in, because of technology. Number two is, I think we really need to also reduce government shareholding to below 50%. Well, it's fine if government is a shareholder. I think we need to reduce it to below 50% so that the bankers actually run are run very in a very uh, corporate and professional manner. Number three, I would suggest is that the banking sector, we, uh, you know, for example, a lot of the bad loans today in the banking sector are not necessarily bad loans in terms of, I mean, of course, some of them are purely bad loans, but a lot of them are also timing related. So, for example, if you can extend the uh, term of the loan to say five to seven years or give them some interest sort of a rebate or some sort of an extension in payment, actually, a lot of these projects can actually come back on stream. So I think for each, as we are now consolidating banks, for each large bank, if you create a bad bank, bring in lots of equity from foreigners and as well as domestic into the good banks, Use that money to, you know, from the holding, use that money to, you know, uh, uh, put some more capital into the bad bank and we just extend the loan term. We can do quite a bit. And hopefully, I think we very often, you know, uh, mistake between a business that has gone wrong and a financial crime. You know, there's a very thin line. So my other suggestion would be that we should also create a separate because financial crimes are unique in nature, a separate, you know, and pay the guys who are running this a lot. And, you know, create an institute which or rather create an agency which can actually probe the financial crimes properly. So I think if we can do these four things, we can really, you know, uh, because banking capital is not the issue, you know, no matter what people might say. It's the systems and processes which are the issue. And as you the point which you made is regulatory changes. We need regulatory changes. Yes, but we also need process driven changes. So, you know, in, in, in the Indian banking sector. Thank you. And Angela, uh, uh, you know, looking from from a European and, and global perspective, uh, you know, Indian banking sector has been uh, uh, fraught with lack of capital, very poor, especially, you know, 70 percent of our or 80 percent of our Indian banking is all largely public sector. The contribution of the private sector uh, uh, and the foreign banks in the Indian asset side is very low. Uh, what uh, do you see as similar challenges to European banks purely from uh, and especially coming out of this COVID impact and others, wherein there is a need of uh, regulatory changes uh, to the banking as a whole. I think so. We lost Angela. So, when you want to give a perspective of what uh, you know, as a as an operator of businesses, uh, you know, do you see there is a fundamental shift in the banking which need to be done? And of course, and I completely agree with every point that Amir made, uh, which is uh, around uh, project finance. For example, project finance, real project finance doesn't even exist in India. You know, uh, most projects, by the time it, uh, it just turns around, and especially the critical projects, you know, where initial years are when you are setting up the project and when the project is just about turning on the corner, 
we see uh, you know the, the term of the project is nearly getting over and there's whole rush to do it get it refinanced and then the refinancing cost that comes in long term money doesn't really exist over here so that's that's a huge uh, challenge uh, technology completely agree i think uh, the interface of the technology you know where the back office might be digitized it's not yet really digitalized it's digitized the front is, is still as opaque as it can be you know maybe uh, for various reasons and that's where why you have so many people who are just being acting as middlemen and brokers and trying to get you get somebody alone and and all this all this nonsense happens and and most importantly if you see even to the npas the most of the npas and if you categorize them are actually large companies so the, but, but the punishment is on the smaller companies who are possibly the, on, on, the, on the real need and who are the lifeblood who runs the blood of the system. That's, so that's where technology can really start impacting. Blockchain for sure is one of them. But there, there are multiple technologies, identity technologies, etc., that can that can come in. And given that the whole digitalization of the back back end that has happened on maybe something like the India stack, I mean that could that could help. But I I do believe that. Uh, that the, the role of the bank, uh, you know, over the years also have changed. Uh, you know, uh, you have to start participating with the business, especially the smaller the business. That guy's CFO is not really a CFO. He's possibly just a accountant, uh, a, a half, not even an accountant, not even a full blown accountant. You know, he's a uh, one guy who was in the in the neighborhood doing accounts for five guys books with some uh, pirated tally. So, so you need to get that guy and and start the conversation, understand the problems up front, and then. Simple solutions can save the day, save the rainy day. And, and that's what, for example, some of the bigger companies have done with their career exchange. You know, when we were in the size of the bigger companies, we used to actively sit with our suppliers and understand their, their economics and, and start taking in calls which, which streamline the bottlenecks and the cash flows. And I think that's, that's, some of that has to become the role of tomorrow's bank. Arun, welcome. Uh, can you hear us well? Yes, I can hear you hear and see everybody. Perfect. Okay, so, I'm really sorry for this. Uh, no problem. So we'll hand over the moderation to you. Uh, so we are on the first question. Uh, myself and Vijay are yet to comment. So uh, I'll let Vijay comment and then I will comment and you take it over from here. Perfect. Thank you so much for handling it so well, Shachindra. And again, no before I let Vijay start, I just wanted to... A, apologize for my delayed entry, and uh, maybe I'll let the first two questions go, and then uh, before we go to the next round, I'll introduce myself as well. So, Vijay, go ahead, please. All right. Thank you so much. I think uh, there are four major problems, which is uh, uh, with the Indian banks. One is the size, and the other is the reach, and then high NPAs. And what is very important is the mindset. Because today we don't have any kind of development bank in India. So the bank who is giving a loan, especially to the small and medium guys, he's only acting as a boss. Let's say an example that there is a delay by the government or there is a delay with uh, these kind of COVID situations or there are some genuine problems which an entrepreneur is facing. The bank is just not concerned. And what they do is, is that overlooking the problems PA. Moment it be PA. No important in India today if we want to SME and uh, the medium scale industrial sector we need to bring back the development banks and they need to be funded adequately so that they can go with the entrepreneur, realize this situation and do not only be an outsider who is going to rather kill him when what he needs most is a, a induction of more capital and getting more time to complete his commitment. Size of the banks has been a very major problem. And what is more important than that is that we are having different regulators who are regulating the lending scene in India. Now, there are different. It is a great matter of great regret that despite being such a big country, 
except for SBI, who is probably very much down the ladder. We don't have a single bank which can match the the capitalization of world banks, different banks in the world. So we need to create larger institutions. One of them, of course, is uh, like merging all the banks. We uh, the process has started, but I think it is not yet picking up pace. We have to bring in all the cooperative banks. We have to bring in all the rural banks so that the policies are uniform and the reach is much bigger, especially in the rural sector. And the rules of the game are well known and they are uniform because most of the rural sector, for want of money from the banks, they are turning to the local money lenders. They are the the rate of interest is somewhere about 50 to 60 percent per annum. And that is how the local farmer or the local small scale person in the village, he is not able to set up any kind of business. I totally agree that we lack in technology. Uh, the process has started. The Indian Prime Minister has been very keen for the digitalization, but we are still a long way to go. And I think we need to uh, develop that side uh, very fast. Now, last problem which I look at is the high NPAs. Uh, I think Suman pointed out that most of our banks would like to play very safe and they would lend the money to the guy who has many more alternatives to raise money. And he will not give it to the guy who really needs it. So what is happening is that most of the large corporations, if any of them goes bad, the amount of NPAs are very, very large. And this is telling on the balance sheets of different banks. I think we need to look on that area. Some of the regulatory measures are there, like insolvency and bankruptcy court, and uh, uh, then prevention of corruption amendment bill. But I think a lot is to be done on the regulator side. And uh, unless we bring more regulations and technology and have large banks, I don't think the kind of banking system which we are running now, there are any chances of improvement in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Shachindra? Yes, sir. So the, uh, I will start from, from, from the position of being a lender, uh, from a professional turning an entrepreneur, uh, and a year and a half back, an entity which raised the highest amount of capital from global institutions of $140 million, uh, set up India's largest, uh, you know, technology led business for SME and micro SME businesses. And obviously our raw material is capital. You know, today we are well equity funded. Uh, and we bought, we did a lot of things. So in fact, uh, you know, people, we created a governance framework. We created an ESG consulting. We brought people like San, you know, Sanjeev Goel, Vincent, William from IFC, a very high board. But when you interact with the banks who are provider of, of capital, what I find, you know, and I'll cover both all the three point of view, yours, uh, Arun, which is weakness of bank governance and reforms. For Indian public sector bank, I think so the risk appetite is not driven by a systematic and analytical understanding of risk. The problem is that Indian banks continue to be overweight and to rely on the ownership and the promoters behind businesses rather than actually understanding the underlying business risk. Uh, and in times of crisis, despite liquidity available with them, they are not being able to kickstart the credit disbursement because, you know, they are not used to understand the risk and, you know, take a call. If you look at broadly, the Indian banking asset is of around 13 and 50 billion. 77 percent are still held by public sector bank and 20 percent are held by private sector bank. Foreign banks in India is, is a nominal 1.5 percent. So the wheels of economy are still powered by public sector bank. And to my opinion, privatization is no un answer to re revitalize. It's not that our private sector banks have done you know exceptionally well. Uh, what is actually required, and I you know agree with Amaya, that we need a quality governance which means the boards and the management team uh, of these banks, which can define the risk appetite uh, and also sometimes keeping in mind government social objective uh, and can take prudent call. 
you know, we definitely need an immediate overhaul of the structure of management and governance. Uh, while, you know, few steps taken by government and Indra Dhanush initiative, which was launched in 2015, uh, were good enough, but not sufficient as there is a fundamental shift in the architecture of the banking is required. Uh, you know, PSB, you know, one of one solution could be in terms of governance is that the government can think of consolidating all of its shareholding under and hold co and dilute at that level, bring global investors with the management participation and let that hold co, you know, define the risk appetite architecture management. Uh, so it's not an easy task. It's a five year journey, which government should do. Otherwise, you know, revitalizing the country and the credit disbursement uh, should be difficult. And last in the private sector banks, my view is that for a country as large as ours, you know, the process of increasing the number of banks is still required, you know. So on the one side, you know, what we just said that we need bigger and larger bank. On the other side, you need much, many more smaller, you know, banks, uh, you know, like US, which can actually serve the need of different part of the economy. Thank you, Shrindra. This was uh, uh, very, very helpful. And uh, I see, you know, some very clear themes emerging in uh, in this conversation, uh, starting with technology and for going on to governance, and then uh, really the way in which we, as a as a sector, uh, approach. Aron, hello, sorry, hello. Yeah, are you back? The, yeah, can you hear me? Hello. No, I think so she's still unstable. Yeah. Can you carry on. Yeah. Did I? I think I can hear. Can, can you hear us, Angela? Hello? Okay, I'll, I'll carry on and then uh, we will uh, we will uh, let Angela in as soon as she's able to come in. So just, just going back now, because uh, I know we're already at uh, one twelve and uh, uh, in the morning in D.C., uh, where I am, uh, and we have 18 minutes left in the session. So I'll, I'll very quickly just introduce myself since I couldn't join in the beginning. So, uh, you know, I, I stepped down as chief investment officer at the IFC for uh, last year to uh, sort of paint on a broader canvas. So I currently am a senior advisor to MasterCard and a few other global corporations, but I haven't uh, left IFC fully. So I still also advise the IFC and uh, I began my career with the Reserve Bank of India. So, uh, you know, this is uh, wow. very much... Uh, home turf for me in, in many ways. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but I'll stop here because uh, in the interest of time, but I, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, one way or the other, I've kind of been in the, in most of the spaces that uh, you are including Angela's space because I was also the client officer for uh, Mexico for IFC for many years include, and did a lot of work with uh, Banamex and others in Mexico. Uh, and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's just by way of introduction. So now I'm just moving on to our next question, uh, which really relates to what do we do now? You know, we've talked about the more strategic uh, issues around uh, the challenges of the banking sector. But now we have a unique problem before us, which is a crisis that we have off the like we have never seen before uh, in, in COVID. And it is a very different crisis because all the other crises that the banking sector and the financial sector around the world have faced have been really financial crisis. This one is a real sector crisis, starts as a public health crisis, goes to a real sector crisis, and now it is impacting the financial sector. And the issue is, given the already the challenges that have been very eloquently described by the panelists uh, as a response to the first question, uh, what is the best way of doing two things. A, maintaining the stability of the banking system so that the the systemic stability and the important role they have in preserving the faith of the depositors uh, whose money they have, that is not shaken on the one side. And the second is then on the other side, how do they get recapitalized and uh, able essentially to support the recovery because you know th this is when the market SMEs and even bigger corporates, middle markets really need their help. So what it has to, what should the approach be to, given where we are to come out of this this challenge 
and help the country back on its recovery. So, so with that, uh, let me let me reverse the order here, and uh, maybe Shachindra, you can start, and then we'll go from uh, uh, go from there to then we'll go go to Angela, and then to Ameya, then to Suman, and then finally to Vijay. So go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, Arun. So I think so my view is that uh, you know the post uh, this crisis, one of the thing which will definitely come out and probably some of the forbearances restructuring would delay the process but what you will definitely see is a serious undercapitalization for the banks uh, except few of the private sector i think so generally most of the public sector banks and small private sector banks uh, so on and so forth uh, would be seriously undercapitalized now the challenge with the public sector bank have been that the only provider of capital is the sovereign which is the government of india and that does not lead to a systematic change in the behavioral aspect of these banks in my view as i said in my first opening comments that the public sector banks capitalization process should be driven by external capital uh, and it's not that government has not tried that but it has not been fruitful i think so the way to do it is government should use its sovereign power uh, and some form of a sovereign guarantee wherein once you consolidate all of this shareholding in one holdco uh, government can guarantee some kind of a flow return and dilute at the holdco level and you know drive external capital along with change in the management and we have an example if you look national investment and infrastructure fund which is run by an ex ifc person you know look at the size government provided the seed capital and set up a completely professional management for where the gp ownership and the fund are managed independently they have been able to drive very significant amount of capital so that's one second uh, you know in these circumstances how true regulator would like the balance sheet to appear so one you know one approach is that you know you should you know not allowed allow any kind of re regulatory forbearances uh, and let bar bank balance sheet should come out clearly but i don't think so that is possible because it would create so much of systematic risk that you know the whole system would collapse so regulatory forbearance would be required in some form but i think so what the regulator should be cautious enough not to allow banks to use these forbearances to hide uh, you know things under the carpet right so there has to be a mechanism of uh, very serious supervision which is required uh, for the banks uh, for creating and bringing back the economy to normal thanks uh, angela um hello so sorry all are you are you listening to me are yes you... yes go ahead go ahead please do you hear go me ahead. yes <clears throat> go ahead Yes, we do. Okay, we do. It's because I am on and off all the time, so I don't know if I lost the first question. No, but maybe you can you can answer. To, uh, you know, either the first or the second, your choice. I cannot follow you. Uh, uh, I cannot. You can, I cannot hear you well. Uh, okay, maybe I type the message. Uh, okay well maybe um i can start but yeah please go ahead okay i think that you are talking about no, the, 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 the 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 do you hear me i think that you are talking about the recapitalization um the, yeah. the main the main thing that it can be for recapitalization i would say that apart from some a monetary policy from the government that can be like for example uh, provide uh, any any type of liquidity necessary like for purchase uh, corporate bonds and so on uh, and the relaxation of of some of the um the the the, um, the, 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 the amount of the collaterals uh, that are needed as a guarantee for the banks um, as well as uh, providing any financing that can be done from the central uh bank of 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 india to well, the lowest interest rate i think that um it should be done like an effort in increasing the productivity and also the increasing the efficiency i think that you have mentioned previously the impact and the that uh, that the, the the emerging technologies um, emerging technologies may have on that i would say that it would be needed also um, a restructuring on the financial sector it said that for example mergers between the top banks 
they have a more um, sounded and a higher level of capital adequacy ratio with the smaller banks maybe. And then also um, the, the impact that can be emerging technologies such as blockchain or artificial intelligence uh, to cut the, the bank cost to maybe also as a way to have a better um, tools for for making better decisions uh, related to the to the to the to the credit uh, also to manage the uh, the the credit risk and and to reduce the operational risk with more automatization and on the other hand i think that it will be particularly helpful in the terms of all this um, non-official uh, economy, all that or non-bank population as a way of financial inclusion. Um, I think that is quite remarkable, um, the increase of the use of uh, digital assets in India since it has been uh, lift the ban on, on the use of, of, of this type of assets. So um, I think it is a great opportunity for India, uh, being one of the most populated countries in the world, to try to capture the value of uh, of uh, such a big market uh, by 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 trying to invest more in emerging technologies in order to be more compet more competitive and um, and have a competitive advantage uh, related to to other countries. Right. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Amaya. Thank you. You know, I think uh, I had shared some of my ideas in my opening uh, your line, in my opening uh, salvo, but I'll just reiterate them. I think I agree with what uh, was said earlier by the comments. I think the NIF model is a great model. You know, the great thing about the model is it's that it's owned 49% by the government and 51% by the institutions around the world, such as Adia and other sovereign wealth funds. So the main problem I see with uh, the Indian banking system is governance. And uh, also, you know, there's over, I would say there's overreach of the bureaucrats and the government authorities. And it's not banking, you know, which is done. And a lot of, especially also Vijayji mentioned right now that there is some fear factor, which is, in, which I've seen, you know, across bank. What I would suggest is that, uh, as I said earlier, for each good bank, government creates a bad bank, you know, which is held by the same holding company. We raise global equity into that. Uh, we'll raise global equity into that uh, bank. Use some of that money to, you know. And as I said, a lot of the loans. And uh, uh, one of the colleagues also spoke about project finance. A lot of the loans need not necessarily be bad loans immediately. It's just that because of, I mean, you know how complex it is to execute anything in India. Because of all of those things, those loans will get better with time if we just give it a longer duration, you know. And so I think we can use most of the bad bank loans will come back. Uh, so that's the first step. Number two is reduce government shareholding to 49% by both bringing in external capital as well as raising domestic capital from people. Reliance's rights issue is a good example that there's a lot of capital also available in India for good companies. So if we clean up the banking system, that will be useful. Number three is by reducing it to 49%, we need to remove this fear of CVC and CBI, which mm. all the banks have. So I think in order to do that, and as, as I keep saying that while financial crimes are serious crimes, we need a completely separate financial crimes authority, you know, and the guy who is, you know, probing uh, a, a murder cannot also, or, or, you know, is, is probing a riot, cannot also probe a financial crime because, and let us pay them extremely well, you know, in terms of, uh, number four is, I think we need, as Angela mentioned, we need to bring in blockchain into the economy, uh, into the banking system, so as to reduce fraud. I mean, blockchain, unfortunately, in India has become a bad word, but we need to use that bring in blockchain and really, uh, you know, integrate that within the system. And lastly, I think the other point which I believe is that we need to pay our bank, especially PSU banking employees better. Because, and I think once you corporatize it, remove them from being government servants, I think what happens is you can actually pay them market rates. So I think we need to pay them better so the best quality of people come on stream. I think, honestly, these are the, the real challenges in the Indian banking system are process-driven. You know, and, and, as, and you, so you mentioned, sir, that COVID has become a crisis for the banking sector. I think the banking sector were already in crisis before COVID. I think it was in a deep, deep crisis before COVID and it's been going on for a while. I think COVID has only exacerbated the issue. But on the contrary, I think COVID is an opportunity because in India, things are only done and solutions are only found when water is up to here. You know, when we have no, no longer space to breathe. And 
right now that is what has happened thanks to covid so i actually think covid is a opportunity the covid created issues which yeah. i hope yeah. that the government as well as institutions act on it yeah thanks okay. thanks amar so we've got just about 5 minutes left so i'll ask uh, suman uh, and vijay uh, to go so vijay go ahead all right uh, i think what i would like to say is that if we have to identify one single factor for a bad banking in india for a very long time it is nothing but the government of india because of their interference into the banking sector majority of the things in indian banking sector have gone wrong over the years if you really look at the npas majority of the npas are those which have been granted because of an interference by the political bosses and now there is so much of fear in the mind of the decision maker at the banks that they are just not interested to take any decision if you look at about 800000 crores of rupees are parked with rbi banks are flush with funds but nobody wants to take any call of giving the money to anyone because they are scared for the backlash which can come to them even after retirement on a ground of taking a wrong decision the government i will rather go ahead what amia said the government should bring down the equity to 24% so that even a special resolution doesn't give government permission so in the time is less i think if the government interference is stopped in banking our banks will become some of the best in it, in the world because our bankers are most outstanding bankers somewhere this is what my personal interaction says they are among the best in the world thank you thank last word suman yeah so i think uh, we have all spoken about uh, nba and how do we uh, the npas and how do we uh, uh, you know work on it but my side my question might i'll take it from the other side uh, you know you, we must learn how to work with a uh, large part of indian swaths of indian businesses are unorganized or semi organized they need help you will have to work with them bankers instead of having these tons of people and 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 varieties of brokers around their system bring them into the system to help these guys you know from the time they take a loan from the time of the utilization of the loan you take a short term loan you're putting it in an asset which is a long term asset obviously you will get into a bad debt situation so work with them along with their value chains value streams help them grow their business this is also a time when we have to rethink the covid is an opportunity for us to rethink the opportunity to see how do we create value streams how do bankers also get integrated with the with the, with the way the businesses operate work with the guys who are taking your money and ensure that they whether they need an extension of a loan whether they need a period change whether they need a certain amount of management input that has to be done if tomorrow's the 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 the, the people who take the money they are they become viable part of the indian economy okay well i'll stop you here thank you suman uh, just to wind up i have only less than a minute to wind up so first thanks everybody for for their contributions i'm going to do a little i don't have time to summarize it here because the they will cut us off so i just firstly want to say thanks to all of you for coming together and including uh, in particular angela for getting up so early in uh, in spain and thank you. Uh, and i'll send a summary around by email at least to the panelists and frank and hopefully put that in the conference proceedings because then there's some very very good ideas in this panel coming from the people who do this for a living and who are facing this uh, day in and day out and i'm particularly thankful to the panelists for the idea around the role of the niif model i think that is in a way the core of a key core of the solutions if we get our governance right we can do a lot of things so thanks very much uh, and really appreciate it and i said we will be i'll be in touch with a summary email to all of you thank you so much thank you arun uh, you thank have you. done a fine job and uh, steering the whole panel thank you so much thank you, thank you. sorry for the technological hassles thank you thank you thank you so much bye 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 thank you bye are we out bye bye, bye. bye. Yeah.